Hi everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Develop and Deploy Deep Learning Services at the Edge with IBM. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. Chris and Amit have created a wonderful presentation for us today. This content is pre-recorded, which allows them to be online to answer questions real-time via the Q&A widget throughout the event. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets. All of the widgets, as well as the slide area, are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. If you have any questions during the webcast, please submit them through the Q&A widget. We'll try to cover as many questions as possible during the live Q&A portion, but if there's any we don't get to, we'll post them on the forum to keep the conversation going. Be sure to check out the resource list for links to the developer site, forums, wiki, and more. And if you run into any technical issues during the webcast, you can find answers to some common technical issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. And with that, let's get started. Thanks, Lon, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm very excited to share with you the great work that Chris and the team at IBM has done to enable AI deployment from cloud to edge using NVIDIA's Jetson platform. Deep learning and AI enabled by NVIDIA GPUs is transforming every industry. The workflow for deploying a deep learning-based solution has two phases, training and inferencing. Training is the phase where you develop your models based on the data that you have collected and is usually performed in the cloud or in a local data center using servers such as NVIDIA's DGX. Inference is the deployment of the trained model to process the new data and depending on the application can be implemented in the cloud as in the case of Amazon Echo or at the edge as in the case of intelligent cameras and autonomous robots. The deployment of AI solution for large complex systems such as smart cities and industrial IoT requires a hybrid cloud to edge architecture where the AI processing is done with local data at the edge and with the aggregated data at a higher level in the cloud. As we will see later today, NVIDIA's common GPU architecture and software tools for training and inferencing in cloud and edge make it the ideal platform for developing these solutions. Some of the key factors that are pushing AI to the edge for these applications are the volume of the data and the required bandwidth, the latency of processing, data privacy, and the availability of network. To address the need for AI processing at the edge, we created Jetson TX2. It is a credit card sized AI supercomputer on a module powered by 256 core Pascal GPUs and six CPU cores that can operate in less than 10 watts. It comes with Jetpack, a comprehensive SDK for building AI applications with optimized libraries for deep learning, computer vision, graphics, and multimedia processing. We also provide a development kit for developers to get started. So without further ado, let me hand over to Chris to show you how you can use Jetson TX2 to build and deploy your deep learning solution on the edge with IBM's Edge solution and Watson IoT. Welcome to the webinar. We're thankful to NVIDIA who graciously allowed IBM to present today. Today's presentation covers IBM's Edge solution in beta for deep learning service development and deployment to edge devices. What can you do with IBM's Edge system? You can deploy any deep learning or traditional routine that can be delivered using Docker on Linux. You can leverage the utility of standard Docker registries for containers and versioning. The system is autonomous, intended for no ops, low overhead operation. IBM's Edge Compute solution operates on Linux capable hardware, including Raspberry Pi, x86, 64-bit, PowerPC and Jetson TX2. Today's presentation centers around the TX2 running the latest Jetpack 3.2 RC developer preview, enabling out-of-the-box support for Docker CE. We are eager for developers to try this out and to hear your feedback as this is a beta developer preview. The IBM Edge system supports the emerging paradigm of pushing compute to the data. As devices proliferate, we reach a point where the amount of data captured at the source vastly outstrips our ability to stream it all to the cloud. 
data is often perishable and insights must be derived at the edge. Increasingly, in support of autonomous systems, we're moving toward cognitive capable decision making at edges that requires lower latency and increased processing power over traditional decision making. This system is cognitive focused in nature, supporting edge intelligence via a direct effort in pushing compute out to the edge. IBM Edge forms an autonomous ops system, which establishes trusted agreements between machine nodes, brings in blockchain ledger, and assures security of services via cryptographic signing of containers and deployment patterns, and sandboxing of code container execution. Implications on privacy are favorable over cloud-centric service approaches. Of course, as data can stay at the edge. Streaming to cloud can be arranged as the service officer designs, only as needed, say, for training or anomalous event reporting. A simple example of running services on IBM's Edge, we're going to register this TX2 as a node on IBM's Edge solution. The node will be registered in the central exchange, and the TX2 will pull the NetSpeed service, which runs a version of Speed, C Speed Test CLI in Docker, along with uh, ping tests and upload download speeds um, and uptime, and streams this data to Watson IoT platform. As you can see, we've set up a card-based dashboard interface to display the information. And while we've previously pushed information to this dashboard, nothing is running on the TX2 right now, no Docker containers. IBM's Edge agent has been set up, and I'll walk you through those commands. Um, but first, we'll go through the information that's required for the NetSpeed service itself. That is housed in a JSON input file. This file defines the URL describing the spec for the service itself, what versions of the service can be run, and in this case, anything from you know, first to infinity versions, um, so any version in the system. Watson LTP org ID, device type, and authorization token, which have been set up in the cloud are required. Uh, we'll go through that setup a little bit later. And ping interval, and in this case, I've set that to every one second for sake of demonstration. Last thing we'll look at before registering are the node ID and node token, which need to be passed into the registration command. Username and password, I've obfuscated mine here. And if the account already exists in the exchange for your user, you don't need to pass in your email address upon registration any further. So I'll register this node with the edge agent, referencing my node ID, node token, my input file, username and password, and this will pull down the NetSpeed to Watson IoT service from the public organization. Anybody can run this. So it hits the exchange, sets global variables, microservice uh, metadata, and we'll watch the agreement progress. Right now it's blank. There are no current agreements with IBM Edge, and you'll see this fill in in a moment. The agreement negotiation process connects machines to machines. In our case, the agreement has just been created, and it will go through an acceptance and finalization process. And then we'll see the Docker container start to run after it's pulled from the public Docker registry. We've enabled the pushing and running of Docker containers in public registries. This one will be pulled from public Docker Hub. So the agreement has been accepted and finalized. It just began to execute. So the Docker container had been downloaded. And you can see the hash name of the workload itself, NetSpeed to the Watson IoT platform, and data is being streamed every second. The software lifecycle in IBM's Edge looks like this. The developer writes and tests some code at the edge using single or multiple containers as needed. The developer then signs their container and deployment definition using their cryptographic key, such that only the intended architecture specified will be able to run these services, and only Docker images specified by the microservice definition can be pulled by edge nodes. Services may be defined as public or private, denoted by an organization name, to define access. Third, the Docker container images are pushed to a Docker registry, either a private registry like IBM's Bluemix container registry or a public Docker registry like the Docker Hub. Fourth, your service definitions are published to the exchange and to the system's agbots. 
the exchange is a central repository for all service specs in this case. Agbots or agreement bots will pull the exchange for newly published services and pull the edge system for newly registered nodes. Once a node is registered, Agbots will establish an agreement per service pattern, enabling the node to pull its containers and begin executing. The node verifies the cryptographic signature of the service and container image, pulls the image, and configures it autonomously, then begins to run compute on that edge. All subsequent edge software management is also autonomous. A view of the system components as part of the whole, the distinction between edge nodes and cloud nodes arises only due to physical location. Everything on the system is an edge. Fully autonomous edge nodes, single board computers, x86 cloud server boxes are all edge nodes. Offer services, establish agreements via Agbots to collaborate. Device identity is managed via a central exchange. Software components and metadata. In developing a container-based service, the developer provides three key definitions. These are in the form of JSON format files, which specify the approved container images, version, and API spec, intended node architectures, deployment signature, and container registry tag. The microservice definition on the left is the container responsible for access to the physical hardware interface. Our CPU load example uses a container as a microservice, which accesses CPU load information and serves it on a local HTTP RESTful endpoint. This could be GPU, other system information um, for the sake of example. A workload definition then, which leverages one or more microservice container for hardware access and performs transformations on the emerging data stream. For CPU load, the workload establishes connectivity with the MQTT message broker and forwards CPU measurements onto Watson IoT platform at regularly polled intervals. We could do the same for GPU. As a pattern definition on the right, specifying one or more architectures that may run the microservice workload container group. For services that may be run on multiple edge types, x86, ARM64, ARM, the definition of all variations are housed in this one definition file. These definitions for microservice workload and patterns are all published to the exchange and they bookkeep the location of related container images in the Docker registry. One or more Docker containers per microservice and one or more Docker containers per workload are published in this way. Edge node container configuration. This paradigm is highly flexible for developers. Microservices are able to access local hardware and privileged operating system services as specified in their deployment description files and as enforced by their software sandbox and Docker. Workload code is also sandboxed and given local private access only to the microservices that are specified in their local agreements. Workloads are also able to communicate with their local MQTT broker to send data or receive commands. And now we'll dive in to set up a device on the system. We'll start first with cloud and then move on to edge. Getting started setting up our device, we'll start with the IBM cloud side. We will visit IBM Watson IoT platform portal and will provide information, credentials, etc., such that we can establish two way communication over MQTT when we set up on the edge side. We'll also define our Jetson TX2 as a device in the portal itself. When we visit the portal, you can either create a free account if you haven't already established an IBM ID, or you can log in with your IBM ID. And I'll provide my credentials here. Once this is ready, it'll take us to the IBM Cloud dashboard page where we can get access to all the services under our account. You'll see Watson IoT Platform tools, access to APIs and services, new uh, features, web apps, and access to, access to Watson services. So nothing has been created uh, in this dashboard yet. I'll create a resource for IoT Platform It auto-generates a name, creates that in my default region and location, and defaults to the light tier of services. So we'll create that here. That'll take us to a launch page where I can either read up on documentation, more information about how the system works, or launch the service directly. This will take us to our dashboard for specifically Watson IoT Platform 
where we can get access to the devices that we've created, device types that I've outlined, and dashboards that take me to a link to display information about the devices that are on the system. I can custom create dashboards that are card-based, uh, like the NetSpeed one. Uh, I can list devices here, find out members uh, of my organization, and I can, in particular, as we'll do today, enable experimental features and additional settings for this edge preview. This Again, this is a beta. We're very interested in your feedback. Uh, we're going to continue to improve this as developers uh, continue to use the system. So first we'll go to devices and add a device type. This device type will be a gateway in order to enable it for edge capability and support uh, MQTT store and forward. We support that under the gateway type. So I define my gateway and I can provide a description if I can spell correctly. In addition, I can define additional information per gateway, any uh, manufacturer model description and other metadata that I provide here will be uh, relayed to every other gateway instance as I create it. I can override it at the time. So all of these uh, settings can be adjusted. Click next here and I'll skip the advanced interface creator step. So we've created our device type very simply and now we'll create an instance of our gateway device representing our TX2. And I'll just copy that for my own use. Again, if I were to have defined general uh, model number description, etc., information and metadata, that would have translated here and I could override that as I see fit. I can auto-generate or provide an authentication token. And in this case, I'll set my authentication token myself, a little easier to remember. And at this step, it's important and critical that I retain this information, including the organization, because that will be useful for edge device setup and I won't be prompted with this information again. Um, if there were any events from this device, I could see them uh, popping up here as they stream in, see the device state, device information, etc. in this menu. The last step on the cloud setup side is to set up an API key for communication cloud to edge. I'll use a standard application. Uh, it's already auto-generated an API key and authentication token, so I can confirm that here. And if I want, I can set an expiry date for the API key itself. So there's my single API key, and I've recorded that information. So we're all set up, and we'll move to Edge side to complete setup for the TX2. Now the IBM Cloud and Watson IoT platform portal environment have been prepped with information necessary to dis describe this Jetson TX2 and API keys for communication with cloud. We'll move to the Edge side. After completing cloud side device setup steps, visit the IBM Edge Quick Start Guide available from GitHub in open source. All of IBM's open source code repos for this Edge solution are housed here in the Open Horizon organization. This examples repository contains code samples, which our developer Glenn Darling will walk through in a moment, and a wiki as a central resource for getting started guides, deep learning container build resources, and general information. If I start with the Edge Quick Start developer guide, this is a concise description of the process for dev, test, and deploy of user-developed code in the IBM Edge environment. You can see links here for developer detailed developer guide, additional information, and the Open Horizon repo. We've already done our setup in Watson IoT platform, so we'll skip to the Edge node side. This is a, a compilation of the prep steps that are required for prepping the Edge node for package install transferring the cloud side gateway and device IDs and credentials created in Watson IoT platform and testing the local and cloud side MQTT messaging brokers to ensure that the configuration is, con is correct. So we'll go some, through some of these as an overview. Uh, we'll provide the Blue Horizon apt repo link in sources.list.t and set the apt repo to testing. Then we'll configure further uh, sources.list.d, Blue Horizon specifics, 
um, for architectures for AMD 64, ARM 64, or ARM itself. Then you'll pull the uh, correct Docker repo key and, and add the repository uh, to reflect the current Docker version, and then install Horizon WIOTP and Mosquito clients for testing. And this will help out greatly. We'll go through a verification step to ensure that our MQTT broker is set up correctly to talk to the cloud. For convenience, our environment variables uh, are set so that we can uh, use those more conveniently in command line tools. Uh, you'll notice Watson IOTP org ID, gateway type, and ID and token. We'll place those there, uh, conf configure our architecture, and then note our Docker Hub ID, our Docker Hub username, um, and additional details. So I've done that here. You can see I've added our credentials in from the gateway. So I'll dot that and set those environment variables. Then we'll verify our gateway credentials, check those, download the uh, messaging.pem cert so that we can pass that along in, in mosquito sub and pub commands. And I'll, in one window, subscribe to this topic, and in another window, to test my MQTT connection, I'll publish. And so I should, in the top window, see that hello world statement indicating that things are working. Now we'll register the edge node. So we'll run Watson IOTP agent setup. And this will go through all the detailed setup steps for the Watson IOTP Horizon agent itself, configure certificates, and restart the Horizon service. So you can see it's initializing this TX2 as a Horizon node, setting global and microservice and workload variables, and setup of the agent is complete. So we'll verify that this node is configured and then we'll look for agreements being made. This node is now going to download four Docker containers that comprise the Watson IoT platform agent. They should all be running by the end of a few minutes. So we'll check these steps. It looks like our agreement was created, accepted, and finalized. And then we'll check to see if our Docker containers have come down. Not quite yet. So we'll watch this command. And after a minute, these four containers are downloaded and beginning running. These are the essentials for the Watson IoTP connection environment, Edge Core IoT workload, Edge Connector, MQTT broker, and IM. And you can see that the agreements are not cycling. If on the system an agreement produces bad data or violates the conditions of an agreement, it will be killed by the Edge agent, and our containers have all started and are executing and up for about the same time. So that concludes the initial steps for setup on the Edge device, and we can We've talk further about an edge development. In the cloud, what it takes to set up an Edge for registration on the system, and now we'll go over the steps and items necessary for development of custom services. Custom service container development. We have a number of simple examples to follow, which can be used as templates for custom applications. In general, develop your code on the edge hardware you intend to deploy. Separate firmware-like functions, file system, device access, video brokering into dedicated microservices. Write workloads that consume these microservices and their stream outputs. Using this pattern reduces individual service complexity affords advantages of reuse and security via restricting workload container access only to authorized microservices. When testing, simulate the production environment, use Docker networking to bridge container networks and isolate from the host, develop patterns for easily specifying deployment of services across multiple architectures. Hello everyone, I'm Glenn Darling from the Horizon team and I get to walk you through the fun part of the Quick Start Developer Guide and by that of course I mean the code development and signing and publishing part of 
it. So you are expected to have already done all of these early steps before you come here, and then we're going to develop and publish your code. So you need a couple of tools for that, just get and make, so make sure you have those installed. And then you can just do like I'm going to do, copy and paste commands from the developer guide directly into your shell. So that downloaded our repo. And I'm going to go into examples, edge, services, CPU. This is where our microservice example is. And when I say microservice, it really is 34 lines of uh, born shell code. And there are three Docker files provided. The make file will pick the appropriate one when you just type make to build the container. And I've built this a few times, so it's super fast here. Now I'm going to go build the workload container as well, which is in a different subdirectory. And has a similar structure here and there's additional make file uh, commands that you might want to take a look at if you're going to actually copy this and do some of your own development with it and now we need to uh, log into a docker registry and i'm just going to use docker hub here and then we need to tag and push those Docker images. So copy, tag the first image, and of course you could write a, a bash script to do all of this for you in one step. Um, and in fact, or, or edit your makefile. In fact, the makefiles that we've provided have a published target that will do exactly this. So build it with those tags and they will go ahead and Docker push them up to the Docker registry. But I just wanted to show you here the steps that are actually necessary. So at the end of all this, those two images will be up in Docker Hub. And of course I've done this a few times. That's why it's layer already exists for all those commands and they went really, really fast. And hopefully that's your day-to-day -day development cycle that I just illustrated there because you're, you're a Docker user and you're a make user and a Git user. Um, but now we've got some horizon specific stuff to do, which is the really cool stuff of actually signing your code cryptographically and uh, publishing it in a way that uh, millions of edge devices can pick it up automatically. So we need to create an asymmetric key pair for us to do our signing. So I'm going to put my IBM credentials in here. You can use whatever you like, uh, whatever company name and whatever user email. and it will create a key. It's a little bit slower on the ARM64 devices right now due to a bug in Go's large integer uh, library, but it's pretty fast on uh, AMD64 like this one, but I'm gonna pause the video anyway. Okay, so our keys have been created, our key pair has been created. You can see them sitting here. Uh, oh, I need to move them. So I expect them to be in the home directory. I forget to go back there. So here they are. And uh, now that the keys are there, we're going to go ahead and use them to sign the code that's in the microservice. So to do that, we need a little bit of uh, configuration information, but we try to make that really easy for you. So nsubst will take the values that you were already asked to put in the environment, and it will use them to populate this template file that we've created for you. So uh, let's just take a look at that. You can see what it is. So it's populated the version, the name of the container, and the Docker hub uh, or, or Docker pull command uh, token that you need to pull that. So the agent will use that to pull the image. Now let's go ahead and publish it and sign it and publish it. So this command takes the private key and the JSON that's shown above on the screen, and it will sign the microservice, and then it will uh, push it up to the um, 
I mean it will publish it to the Horizon Exchange. And then you can go ahead and verify that it was published to the Exchange, verify the signature by using the public key. Um, but let's just skip those steps for now. They're shown above there if you want to try them on your own. Now let's do the same for the work loan. We'll create the definition JSON. And now we're going to sign and publish the workload. Okay, that's done. And uh, okay, let's go through the verification steps on this one. I, I skipped them on the microservice, but you can see them on the workload. So that went to the exchange and it found this particular version of the workload. And this one will actually ask the exchange to go ahead and verify it for you. Verify that the signature matches and the signature verifies. So that, that means that this code is all good to go. Now all we need to do is uh, update the pattern so that it will contain that workload. So again, we provided a little template file for inserting your workload into the pattern and we'll run n subst on it using the environment variables that you would have set up. And then we'll run the step that actually adds it onto the gateway pattern. Okay, so now uh, it should be part of the pattern. We can verify that with the final command that's shown here. And so the pattern contains uh, my org ID, this the right architecture, the name of the workload, and uh, its version. So it has been added to the pattern. Now any uh, edge node that's registered with this pattern after now will contain this workload as well in the pattern. And the workload can be updated without any uh, changes. But because this particular node is already registered and you already have the uh, IoT core workloads running here and it's already in uh, an agreement for those workloads. So if you do HCN agreement list, you can see the single, there's just a single workload in this array of workloads. Um, we need to unregister it and then register it again so that it'll pick up the second workload that's inside this pattern. So that's the next step here. Um, you might want to copy this uh, original file, but uh, I'm not going to bother that, doing that. I'm just going to jump ahead and prepare an input template that this contains values that you might want to set for the particular workload. And the new workload has some uh, new variables. The example workload has some new variables that need to be set. So this file will go ahead and set them. Then we can uh, unregister. And then we'll go through the WIOTP agent setup step again, which is the one you did before. But again, if you are starting a new uh, edge node, or, or once you have done this development process and you're ready to start um, setting up edge nodes, you only go, need to go through the registration process once, not twice like we did here during this process. Okay, so the Horizon node is unregistered. Now we can go ahead and register it for this updated pattern. Now that that is finished, we should see Yes, we should see state is set to configured. If it's showing configuring, then it's still working on it. If it's showing anything else, then something's probably wrong. And then we can soon uh, see um, HCN agreement list. We should see uh, agreements forming here for both workloads. Aha, so now we have two elements in the uh, agreement list array. We have the one for the core uh, microservice workload, but we also have the um, the CPU to uh, Watson IoT platform, the example code uh, policy. Now, if we go to Docker PS, uh, 
these guys are going to start coming up. So there's one of them. And there's uh, still just one of them. But we'll give that a few seconds. I'll, I'll pause the video for a couple seconds. Okay. Let's take a look again. All right. So I paused the video for about 30 seconds there. And we have... Uh, okay, so this the CPU microservice is running. The CPU to Watson IoT platform workload is running, and uh, three of the four uh, core IoT uh, platform workloads are running. Give it one more try here. Yeah, there we are. Now we've got all four. So now there's six containers running, and uh, and you're all done. So I just wanted to mention a couple of other things. The process for updating your workload code is extremely simple. You just have to publish the new container sign it with this uh, one command here, sign and publish it with that one command, and then insert it into the pattern. And uh, you don't need to go to the edge node again because the agbots will notice this difference and they'll push that difference out to all of the edge nodes. So these two commands alone will result in the code being published to millions of devices if you have millions of devices. Note also that the section at the end of the uh, developer guide shows you how to get some help uh, or to debug what's going on and of course at the very bottom is our discourse link which is the forum that, that we use so uh, you can com come there to get help from the team so I hope you will take your uh, own trip through the quick start developer guide and enjoy deploying code for two millions of devices Thanks. Some development lessons learned, especially where it pertains to GPU access. Pre-built containers are available for pull from Docker's public registry. Some foundational containers that we have and some out-of-the-box demos, including YOLO, Darknet, Digits Utility, OpenCV, CAFE, and NVIDIA's TensorRT utilities. In general, it's a good practice to build base containers with the CUDA, CUDNN libraries you'll require for reuse across multiple child containers which consume them. Most NVIDIA libs can be downloaded independently of the Jetpack install for Jetson, such that they can be packaged into containers for delivery to the edge. This is especially useful for ensuring library version compatibility. In developing deep learning containers, you often test with a display. Volume mounts are essential. Uh, GPU access often requires running in privilege mode. Docker's experimental squash option helps to significantly reduce container size when image builds can exceed 10 gigs. Uh, lastly, running multiple device consuming containers, such as image recognition services that use cameras can be very intensive. There exist kernel modules that can be used to duplicate video streams to N additional devices with minimal overhead. We leverage this a lot for container groups that consume video at the same time and stream insights one to another, in this case for into and face classification. They both consume the camera stream and the output of face classification uh, goes to the into container. Now to get a little deeper into deep learning services running at the edge. Now to show some of the kinds of machine learning focused services that can be run on the IBM Edge system. This includes both GPU-based, CPU-based, severable or connected, as in cloud-connected services, and routines that operate solely at the edge. Two such edge-based services are face classification and RL2. Face classification is an example of an open-source TensorFlow-based CNN using a Keras model trained on facial dataset and reporting emotions and expressions. Starting this up in a Docker pattern, so we can take a look at it. It was originally developed completely apart from Docker and an inference focused device like the Jetson, but it can be packaged in Docker to be delivered over IBM's Edge solution and still leverage our local GPU. The second Edge-based workload is RL2. RL2 leverages an LSTM-based neural network model for sound state classification. When RL2 executes as is for the first time, it has no ground truth input data that must be provided. Here, I've pre-recorded two sound clips, one of which uses the repeated word upload. What I'm going to do now 
is to annotate these instances of the word upload and a few other keywords such that Aural can add the labeled data to its training sets. I've captured another eight or 10 audio clips and Aural is already starting to recognize the upload intent. Upload. And now you can see that the upload intent has been fairly well trained only after a few iterances of the word. I'll go and train other intents, play, skip, etc. Play. Pause. Skip. Upload. It looks like we've trained our aural routine. It can now skip, pause, and play. As time goes on, I can continuously provide additional data to correct false positives and to improve accuracy. A third service to highlight is Watson Intu, an AI middleware for cognitive decision making. Intu establishes a self, uses a knowledge graph to maintain presence and awareness of its surroundings, a C++ code base, it is natively designed to leverage multiple services at restful endpoints. WebSocket capabilities and extensions in Python allow the use of edge-based services also. We've packaged Intu up into a Docker container such that it can be delivered on Jetson TX2, other NVIDIA-enabled platforms, AMD, AMD64, and it can leverage edge-based services such as those that we're running right now. We've, our Face Emotion agent is running as well in the background and streaming its uh, insight data, the results of its classification, to Intu. In addition, our aural workload is also streaming its insights to Intu. Through the use of Intu's agents, data streamed from GPU-enabled services, cloud services can be act acted upon for user interaction and complex decision making. We have open source templates available to walk through the process of creating agents and acting on Blackboard data. We hope that you'll visit our open source repos and contribute to the project. So we've seen these AI and neural network deep learning enabled containers. We'll go through each in detail, uh, the first of which is Aural V2. Aural is an in-house developed audio routine using a long short-term memory LSTM model for continuous training of command words. Aural is a sound state classifier it's applied to human speech. As Aural monitors the local mic, it scrapes audio about 30 times per second, calculating probabilities for each world state. Once it's trained, it can distinguish between the same words spoken with differing intent. For example, play, and I pressed play on the stereo. This is increasingly helpful in a world where we typically use wake words to initialize audio capture for speech analysis. Benchmarking, it consumes less than 10% CPU on an 800 megahertz x86 laptop, uh, non-GPU. It could run well on a TX2. It displays characteristics of negative latency. In other words, it often converges on the intent before the speaker has finished uttering the word. This aids in the development of more realistic interactions via speech with devices. All data remains at the edge, especially helpful where privacy is concerned. Transfer learning is possible via exchanging model label and audio files between devices. Face emotion classification. This workload is a face emotion classifier model, an example of an open source deep learning code base trained in a large face data set from a Kaggle competition in 2013. Training time uh, using two NVIDIA GRID K2 GPUs is six to 20 hours, depending on parameters and settings. Um, it runs well on a TX2. The model using Keras and TensorFlow calculates the probabilities of one of seven trained classes representing facial expressions, angry, disgust, fear, happiness, sad, surprise, and neutral. And it's reported along with the likelihood score. We leverage this in Intu to determine facial expressions for interaction with the user. Watson Intu is a recently open source code base from IBM Watson. It's an AI middleware designed to leverage multiple services and tie them together into a single application for complex decision making. This idea dovetails with the concept of embodiment of a self in a computational system with a graph-based memory store and the ability to function when some services are severed or offline. Intu leverages services available in Watson Cloud, such as natural language processing, speech-to-text, weather APIs, and personality insights, and with an onboard GPU, 
Intu may run alongside other deep learning workloads, which stream results to Intu's Blackboard on which to act. Uh, Intu and embodiment AI routines are developed in an effort to arrive at cognitive assistance with an awareness of their surroundings, their users, and each other. We invite you to check out the code base and resources available in the open source and give your feedback as well. That concludes our presentation. We're very thankful for your participation, the developer community in viewing this, and we're very thankful for NVIDIA's developers and NVIDIA as a whole for allowing us to present today. Uh, we're looking forward to your questions and feedback. Hi, thanks for attending the webinar. We had a lot of content that we wanted to show and we squeezed it down into 45 minutes. There's quite a bit, a bit of available about this system. Um, we'll be adding to the content at the public wiki link and repo code base, including examples. So you can go visit that um, at our Open Horizon uh, repository on GitHub. We expect to hear from developers at our forum. There's a link on the uh, wiki as well for our discourse forum. Um, system, and we're interested in your questions about the EDGE system, uh, feedback. We have today with us some longtime IBMers here for our Q&A session. Uh, Rob High, uh, VP of IBM Watson Cloud. Grady Booch, uh, IBM Fellow and Chief Scientist from IBM Watson Labs. And Egan Ford, Distinguished Engineer in IBM Watson Cloud Applied Sciences. We've gotten a lot of questions, uh, you know, through the course of the webinar about the system, uh, containerization, and um, some of the uh, more detailed questions. Uh, maybe we could start off with um, a particularly interesting question from the standpoint of the system itself. Can a hierarchy of devices be configured where the higher layer manages the lower layer? A uh, single device at the highest point of the hierarchy may have internet access. Uh, and I'll let uh, Egan kind of talk about that and uh, where we're headed in that direction. Uh, thanks, Chris. So uh, uh, Horizon, which is the, the name of the, that lower level of, of the edge, um, and uh, Open Horizon is the, is the open source project for that, uh, it was architected and designed to support hierarchies. Um, the uh, the uh, Two of the components at the edge are something that we've been calling an agbot and calling uh, an agent. Uh, the agent tends to be the, the data producer and the agbot tends to be the, the data consumer. And this is from an agreement point of view, not necessarily where the data goes to, but, but identifying and, and orchestrating and creating the agreement and, and identifying the behavior. The agbot code and the agent code is actually the identically same code. The, the, the difference is how they're configured. And you can configure uh, an edge to be both uh, an agbot uh, and uh, an, an agent in, in that it will be responsible for uh, collecting data uh, and then making it available to other edges. And then from that point of view, you could create uh, hierarchies. It's, it's not uh, exactly trivial. There's going to be some work and some coordination and some things that you have to do in terms of your configuration, but uh, it was designed to be operated that way if you wanted to build chains as opposed to uh, just the classic, uh, you know, edge and, and cloud for uh, establishing the relationships between the edges. Uh, in addition, there's been some questions about the purpose of the use of IBM Watson Cloud you know, interface, defining devices, gateways, et cetera, there. And one of the things that's uh, afforded by the use of the system in this way uh, is that device identities are handled um, by a centralized exchange, and you can establish the, uh, the metadata for the connection to IBM Watson IoT platform and IBM Cloud Services through that portal. So when you define your device as a gateway in the portal, and you stream to that device endpoint, you are easily connected, or that data is easily connected to the rest of IBM's um, suite of services. So for example, you can stream to an endpoint, connect that data from that, that endpoint to a cloud uh, database and, and streaming process. And then you can also leverage uh, other IBM tools like BSX, uh, our data science exploration uh, suite of tools, et cetera. IBM Watson Cloud Services, IBM uh, Conversation APIs, and things. So all of these, uh, this connectivity is afforded by that uh, interface. 
We've got another question about uh, why the device was specifically registered as a gateway, and that's to enable uh, the onboard uh, MQTT uh, core IoT connectivity so that uh, those kinds of uh, data streaming kind of capabilities can be enabled. There was a question on the, the, on the platform chosen uh, from NVIDIA side for the doing compute workload and cognitive workload. And uh, as shown in this demo, for, for developing any meaningful AI application at the edge, you would need something like a Jetson CX1 or a TX2, which has an embedded GPU that can run the cognitive workload. And that is why we, we are showing the TX2 in this particular webinar. Yeah, the TX2 is a great example of a device that has bridged the gap between um, IoT, so discrete devices uh, acting at the edge, and devices that can act on uh, insights in a deeper way. And we really find the, the Jetson TX2 with onboard GPU a device that's very helpful for leveraging um, and creating uh, insights and streaming those from the edge. We've got another question. Uh, is Docker the only way to push code to the edge? How do you handle firmware, driver, and OS updates? And uh, Egan can address that one as well. So uh, today, the, the answer is is um, uh, Docker, and and and, and technically, uh, for security reasons, um, the edge is actually pull down the containers. Uh, we don't push anything to them. We don't expose any ports. Uh, so what we've been doing for OS updates is configuring the system to get their OS updates the way they normally do. Uh, the, the OSs that we support uh, for running the Horizon Agent or the, the Debian class of, of OSs, and they can be configured to automatically download and perform uh, updates either from uh, you know directly from the OS vendors or if you have a, a local repository, you can uh, get your packages from that. And then all of the, you know, what we run inside of containers, things like, you know, uh, uh, workloads and services and so on, uh, that, that's principally uh, Docker today because that's what we've invested the time is to orchestrate Docker. Uh, we have invested time and there is code in the open source code base on working with snaps. We've done a lot with Ubuntu snaps and have been looking at that as another vehicle for uh, delivering um, uh, applications and, and services to the edge. Um, we're all, we have uh, been doing research and also exploring what it means to deliver functions to the edge and, and what that looks like and which uh, functional frameworks that we would be um, uh, supporting. Uh, we've done one today already with Apache Agent, uh, for example. And um, so we'll, we'll continue to explore to see what, um, uh, what the market is, is looking for. But right now, given the size of the, the uh, Docker community and uh, the tools that are available and uh, the ubiquity across all the uh, uh, processor architectures that we support, uh, including having ways to access GPUs, for example, at TX1 and TX2, it seemed like a good place to start was with uh, uh, Docker containerization. Hey, Egan, um, there was a follow-on question to your earlier discussion about, uh, about the hierarchical structure of the edge uh, network. Uh, and it was a question that says here, can we define both an AgBot and an agent uh, on the edge device? Uh, you were talking about being able to pair those at one end or the other, but what, are, what about if we wanted a, a gateway that does both? Yes, you can. So the the... the the uh, Horizon code, which is called Annex, um, it's, just, it's a single instance. And whether it behaves as an agent or as an agbot or both, it just depends on the configuration, how it's configured locally. Um, when we first did our, um, um, when we first created our first development experience about a year ago, and we're trying to get people to understand with Horizon version one how to get on on the system and work with it. We actually had the developers um, have their EdgeNet nodes be both an AgBot and and an agent, so they could do their development and simulate all of that within uh, a closed environment. Uh, but you could do that for building chains as well. So it's it's just configuration. They're not two separate processes. It's just separate behaviors defined by configuration for a single single agent. I, I should follow up with that. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> if you'll notice from the yeah. diagrams that Chris showed was that the AgBot and the agents, they, they don't communicate directly. They, they, they communicate through a switchboard and communicate through 
uh, uh, through the exchange. So even though you might have uh, Agbot and agent roles on a single edge device, um, the the uh, uh, um, the coordination, the communication is still going to take place through the exchange in the switchboard. We had another good question about um, container reliability device uh, you know, A to B testing, and the way that it, the system works is you can push, uh, say, workload version one or microservice version one. Uh, Agbots will serve that to all the edge devices that are registered, and then the edge devices will, of course, uh, pull workload version one, so microservice version one, and begin to run it. If a workload uh, or microservice version number two container is defined and seeded in the Agbot then uh, upon Agbot serving that, the uh, microservice version number two will be pulled by all the edge devices registered um, for that microservice. If for some reason data streaming out of microservice version two is incorrect, it's of the wrong form or type, or it violates uh, the checking procedures which you put in place, then the Agbot will uh, cause that agreement to be killed, uh, version two, Container will be will cease to function, and the edge device will fall back to version one. Again, there was a follow up to the follow up about everything going to the, the cloud. Um, you want to try to address that? Yeah, I can answer that. So, uh, so we, let, let's not just just to be clear, uh, the edge fabric that. Um, uh, that's been described is a control plane. And so um, it, it's not the data plane. So yes, the AgBots and the uh, uh, and the agents do communicate through uh, switchboards and, and the exchange. And so that communication will take place wherever the switchboards and the exchanges are um, hosted. And, and in the in the in, in the Watson IoT platform we we host them in in uh, IBM's cloud. Um, what when you define your containers and the startup parameters for those containers, uh, you, you define what the behavior of those containers are. Uh, how do they run? Which containers do they communicate with? And where they stream results to? Uh, and what endpoints? And those are completely configured per the agreement um, that's established by the AgBot um, that the agent picks up and executes on. Uh, and so that the data plane, we, we don't force the uh, data to go any particular any particular place. And I, I hope that kind of answers the uh, answers the question, but it's the coordination communication for the hierarchies are going to go through the exchange and the switchboard. When Horizon was eventually conceived, and, and you can look at the code base, the Horizon version one, uh, it actually did all of this on top of a blockchain. And so there was completely a decentralized system. And that's the first approach that we took in building this, but it didn't scale. And uh, so we, we, we had to look at um, uh, centralization as a solution to solve some of those scaling, um, scaling problems. But the, the you know, current blockchain technologies are giant flat networks, and uh, we couldn't get the transaction uh, throughput rates that we could get uh, so that the edges could be you know, fast and nimble and, and um, uh, get their agreements formed quickly and uh, start executing. Um, so. Yes, today it's, it's the switchboard and exchange are centralized. And, and we are looking at strategies to decentralize that with other types of things like distributed hash tables and so on. Um, but uh, today they're, they're centralized services. Chris, you want to take another question here? Oh yeah, sorry, it was on mute. Um, there was a there was a question earlier that came up in the uh, presentation, and uh, everybody might be interested in the answer about severability. Uh, the behavior at the edge, when severed, will remain constant. It will continue to function as severed. Core IoT services, as part of Watson IoT, will store and then forward the data, the insights from the edge when connected. Uh, there was a question on about uh, training locally uh, for your AI workload on, and um, while while the Jetson platform is ideally suited for inferencing, uh, it is possible to do incremental training. But uh, with this infrastructure, uh, it's easy. To, uh, the recommended way would be to upload 
everything up to the cloud and do the training there and push the new model down to the edge. Yeah, as Amit said, that's the pattern that we see uh, uh, the Jetson device being used around. Now, if you have x86 devices, those devices can be recipients of that data to, um, to initiate training routines. And data can be streamed um, you know, with custom workload creation to other edges or to cloud endpoints. Um, on this system, we consider everything to be an edge. That's part of the flexibility that's afforded by this setup. I think the question on Oral V2 example, uh, Chris, I believe we have a Docker container that uh, that can be used on Jetson for Oral V2. Yeah, the container that was uh, demonstrated in the video uh, runs on CX2, and we'll uh, we'll package that container image up shortly for uh, the demo. I just want to thank everybody for joining us today for this webinar. Thank you for our to our presenters, Amit and Chris. You guys did a great job. Um, we still have a few questions left. We're going to have to answer those offline, or you can find them uh, later on our developer forum, on the NVIDIA developer forum. Um, I just want to uh, make sure you guys know that we're going to be sending you a link to the slides as well as the replay later on today. And if you're interested and you haven't uh, registered for GTC yet, there is a registration code for 20% off uh, located on the console. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining. Uh, keep an eye out for our next invite to the next NVIDIA webinar. And I want to thank NVIDIA for giving us the opportunity to uh, present to everybody. Thank you.